Hello, and welcome to Central Park. My name is Caitlin, and I'm the Associate Director of Interpretation and Programs at the Central Park Conservancy. We're so excited that you're joining us today for Behind the Park, Protecting Central Park's Trees. This is the fifth in a six-part series. Each program explores a different facet of Central Park Conservancy's work, featuring the individuals who do that work. With these programs, we take you behind the scenes so you can learn the ins and outs of park management, restoration, and design. We've already explored statues and monuments, rustic architecture, the restoration of the historic dairy, and Central Park's expansive lawns. If you miss those, you can catch them on our YouTube channel. We'll drop the link in the chat. We'll be together for about 45 minutes, give or take. But before I introduce today's guest, manager of Tree Care, Peter Haupt, I'd like to share a few housekeeping details. First, some tips on how to use Zoom for those of you that might be new to us. You can use the chat feature to say hello and comment throughout the program. If you do, make sure you select all panelists and attendees so that your comments can be seen by everybody. You can also use the Q&A, uh, sorry, the Q&A feature to ask questions. My colleagues will monitor the chat feature throughout the session, but we encourage you to drop questions specifically meant for Peter about his work in the Q&A, and we'll take time at the end of the presentation to answer them. This session also offers closed captioning. You can access it by clicking on the closed captioning icon at the bottom of your screen. Central Park Conservancy is the nonprofit tasked with the restoration, preservation, and ongoing care of Central Park. We preserve and celebrate Central Park as a sanctuary from the pace and pressures of city life, enhancing the enjoyment and well-being for all. Our staff composes approximately 300 people, assisted by a dedicated core of Conservancy volunteers. Since 1980, the Central Park Conservancy has been working tirelessly to restore the park after years of decline and mismanagement. And the thing about restoration is that once you do it, you have to maintain it. And that's a huge part of what we'll be talking about today. I'd now like to formally introduce today's guest, Manager of Tree Care, Peter Haupt. Peter, thank you for joining us today. To get started, I hope you could tell us about your role at the Conservancy and how you came into this line of work. Absolutely. Can everyone see me? Okay, there I am. Hi, uh, my name is Peter Haupt. I'm the tree care manager here at the Central Park Conservancy. Uh, and I have been working here for almost 11 years. Uh, it will be 11 years, June 1st. Um, and uh, yeah, Central Park is, uh, one stop on my tree journey, um, which started a long time ago. I grew up in Western Massachusetts. My family owns a residential commercial tree company. So I grew up around the business. Uh, I started climbing trees when I was around 12 years old, uh, working uh, at the company, um, you know, during the summer times and uh, when I wasn't at school. And then um, I did tree work for a few years full time after high school, at which point I decided that I wanted to pursue this as a career. Uh, and then I got a degree in urban forestry and arboriculture from the University of Massachusetts. Um, and I started thinking to myself, you know, this is, uh, trees are something you could work on anywhere in the world. Um, so I started researching places that I could possibly work, looking for job opportunities and happened to stumble across a, a job opening, um, working with the trees in, in, for the Central Park Conservancy, uh, applied and, uh, it was kind of good timing and um, I've been here ever since. Peter, can you tell us a little bit about your team? Absolutely. So I work with a team of six other arborists and um, that can consist of two lead arborists who uh, assist in developing programs of work and uh, four other arborists and together we all uh, execute those programs of work. Um, we also have a number of outside contractors that we bring in to help us uh, with a lot of the kind of routine day-to-day -day tasks. Great and for those of us from observing from the outside the ropes your team uses to climb trees is I guess nothing short of captivating. Can you tell us about these rope systems and how they're utilized? 
Yeah, sure. So what we're looking at here, uh, that's actually me on the left and um, one of our arborists, Will Vitagliano, on the right. And uh, the rope system that we're both using here is uh, a single rope system. There's another rope system commonly used to access tree canopies. That's a, a double rope system. Uh, and, and the double rope system involves putting a rope up over a branch or through a, a crotch in the top of a tree. Uh, and that rope comes back down. You attach that end to yourself and use a friction hitch on the long standing end. And um, that allows you to ascend and, and descend the tree. Uh, with a single rope system, like we're looking at here, the rope goes up over a branch, through a crotch, back down, and then is terminated at the base of that tree. And then you ascend up and down one single end of the rope using a, a mechanical uh, prusik and end extenders. Uh, what you can see there by my knee is uh, that little blue device is an ascender. Uh, and then up by my head, there is a, that's like the mechanical prusik that uh, helps to cap capture the progress going up and down the tree. Wow. That is so neat. Let's take a step back to talk about urban trees more broadly. Why are trees important for our metropolis like New York City? Well, trees are very important for New York City. Uh, they're important everywhere. Trees uh, convert sunlight into uh, chemical energy. And in that process, they consume carbon dioxide and, and produce oxygen. So, you know, we rely on trees for our survival for uh, those reasons. But, you know, in a city like New York that's so dense and urban, trees provide a lot of other benefits, uh, a lot of other ecosystem services. Um, uh, you know, trees mitigate a lot of stormwater runoff that would otherwise just be going into our sewer system. Uh, so they, um, you know, take a lot off of our utilities by, by, absorbing that rainwater and putting it back and, you know, just recycling it. Um, they cool ambient air temperatures. So, you know, anytime you're inside of the park or any green space in an urban area, the, the air temperatures are, are going to be a, a few degrees cooler than the, the surrounding cityscape. Um, and there's been a lot of research done to show that trees uh, improve people's moods. People are attracted to areas, areas with trees, specifically shopping areas that have trees as opposed to shopping areas that don't have trees. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, a lot of the, the benefits that trees provide are kind of taken advantage uh, or taken for granted on a, on a regular basis. Now to zone in on Central Park's trees. So how many trees do you estimate we have in Central Park? So we have uh, roughly 18,600 inventoried trees in our database. Um, and we only inventory trees that are six inches or greater in diameter. Um, so we probably have uh, another, you know, two, 3,000 saplings that are uninventoried. Uh, and that's just a, a rough estimate, um, you know, spread out throughout the park. And what's the most common tree? that you find in Central Park? The most common tree species in Central Park is a black cherry. There are about uh, 2,500 black cherries throughout the park. And the least common? The least common uh, is, uh, I'd have to say the least common tree is the Chinese tune. Uh, there's only one of them left uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, there used to be a few more, but we've, we've, we've lost them over the years. There were a few specimens um, we lost one nice went to a storm. Um, but yeah, there's one left over by the 6th Avenue South entrance, actually the 7th Avenue South entrance. And why would you say a tree like this is so rare in the park? Um, they are a, a little bit of a sensitive species. Um, it is possible for them to establish in the park and, and become a mature specimen. But, um, you know, the trees in the park are, are up against a lot of uh, issues. They uh, you know, we have a lot of um, poor quality soils throughout the park. There's a lot of exposed bedrock. So, you know, trees are, are dealing with a lot of different things on a daily basis that, um, you know, may lead to them not surviving in the long term. Would you say that Central Park's trees are different from others found around New York City? Yeah, I mean, Central Park is different from the rest of the city. Uh, it's, it's almost a little... 
a microcosm of its own. And even within the park, you have all these little areas that uh, different mic microclimates that, you know, impact the way that trees grow or, um, you know, experience the growing season, their, their flowering, their, their production. Um, and, and we see that from year to year, you know, these seasonal changes and then these sort of changes based on these little different gradients throughout the park. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's definitely different trying to manage the trees in the park as, to, as opposed to other places in the city. Now, some areas of Central Park have very little topsoil. What challenges does this pose for our trees? Yeah, um, so anybody that's been in Central Park, Park has probably noticed that there's a lot of exposed bedrock um, and glacial erratic, you know, big boulders that are just kind of deposited uh, all over the place and, and areas of lawn that just kind of uh, roll into a big rocky top. Um, so we have a lot of big mature trees growing in just a few feet of soil. And as you can see in this photo here, you know, this tree is sort of absorbed part of a rock in its root system. Um, and that's, that's not uncommon, um, but it does present some unique challenges. Uh, our trees are, are very prone to uprooting for that reason. Um, you know, when we have storms, uh, it's not uncommon for trees to just completely uproot. Um, and so we pay particular attention to trees that, that may be vulnerable to that in a lot of different areas of the park. And how does the conservancy decide where to plant new trees in the park? The planting of trees in the park, um, you know, we try to consider the long-term viability of our trees when we're, we're planting new trees. Uh, we plant a lot of uh, floodplain species. So trees like American elms and American sycamores that have evolved to tolerate long periods of uh, drought and, and long wet periods, uh, which are you know very typical of, of an urban environment. Um, so you'll see throughout the park, uh, you know, especially on the drives and in different landscapes, there's a lot of London plane trees, which are actually a hybrid of the uh, American sycamore. The parent trees to the London plane tree are, yeah, the American sycamore and the, the Chinese plane tree. Um, and that, that hybrid is, is very successful in the, in the urban environment. Um, it was uh, planted a lot in the uh, 1930s, 40s, 50s. Uh, by Parks Commissioner Robert Moses. He was the Parks Commissioner from, I think, 19, the 1930s through the 1960s, so a long period of time, and he just planted London plane trees all over the place. Um, but they're, they're great trees, and, and they, they do pretty well here, so um, yeah. Now we want to share some of the interesting specimens, I should say, found in Central Park. So what can you tell us about these two examples? Yeah, so these are... Um, some very unique uh, specimens that we have out in the park. The photo on the left is of a honey locust, and I believe this one is over by the um, the uh, Northwest Reservoir um, near the tennis courts, just off the Bridal Trail. Um, and this is a um, this is actually a, a, a supposed to be a thornless honey locust. Um, this is a, a variety of, of locust that was bred not to have any thorns. A lot of locust species have thorns on the branches. Um, but this is, uh, a, every once in a while, you get a, a, an individual that um, has some type of mutation or something like that. And this one has pushed out giant clusters of thorns all over the trunk. Um, so it's, it's a little bit ominous, but it's a, it's a pretty cool tree. Uh, and the tree on the right-hand side is a, a southern catalpa and that giant growth on the trunk is the result of a target canker that has infected the stem. And we have a lot of trees that have canker issues throughout the park. Um, but this one is really interesting. And, and what, what cankers do, it's a perennial canker. So um, it's a fungus that infects the tree and then the tree is able to, to fight it off. But the fungus comes back each year and reinfects the tree and then the tree fights it off. So you end up getting this wound and these kind of concentric circles where the tree has fought off this infection and then the infection has come back and then it's fought it off. And it's this cycle that creates this giant growth on the tree. Um, and most of the time it's, it's relatively stable and superficial, but we do keep a close eye on those types of cankers. 
tell us about this tree. Um, should we, sorry, I've just gotten a little off track here. This is an old elm. Yeah, this is a beautiful old American elm. You know, the park is filled with amazing American elm uh, specimens, but this is an elm up in the East Meadow, uh, just off the transverse road uh, by 96th Street. Um, and this tree is really magnificent. Uh, if you have a chance, you should definitely go check it out. Just the, the form and the, the structure uh, are really beautiful. It's got these giant low horizontal limbs that kind of snake all over the place and provide a lot of shade. Uh, and it's, it's just an impressive tree overall. It's about 70 inches in diameter. So it's, it's a, definitely a larger tree for the park. Wow. So let's talk about the assessment of the trees. How often do you check each tree, would you say? Uh, we typically do somewhere around 12,000 inspections annually. Um, and those are, you know, routine inspections uh, to more advanced inspections. And um, what we can see in this image here, this is uh, an example of some of the advanced diagnostic work that we do um, with some of our, our more in-depth inspections. And this machine is a tomograph. Um, and it basically measures how fast sound waves are moving through the trunk of the tree. So down at the bottom of the photo, um, there are little sensors that we place all around the, the circumference of the tree. Uh, and you tap on those sensors and, and they're connected to this, this machine that uh, registers how fast the sound is moving through the, the tree to the other sensors and then back to that sensor. And it produces an image of what the cross section of that tree would look like where you're, where you're taking that measurement. Um, and, and we use that coupled with other, um, uh, with other methods to, to get an idea of, of what's going on with the tree. Um, and, and then that helps us to make management decisions. Would you say there are certain trees you have to observe more closely than others? Yes, yes, absolutely. We have trees that we, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, veteran trees that are in a, you know, almost over mature stage of their life. Um, and so we, we approach those trees more differently. We, um, you know, tend to give them a little bit more attention, uh, because, uh, they may have issues with vigor, um, and we want to kind of preserve them for as long as we can, um, as long as it makes sense. We also have a lot of trees in the woodlands where we, um, you know, we'll, we'll preserve trees that we would typically cut down in the landscapes. We'll, we'll leave them as like a, a shaft or a snag um, for wildlife, you know, to kind of promote, um, you know, ecological diversity and get more, you know, species using those areas of the woodlands. Can you break down the word invasive for us? Why do we have invasive trees in Central Park? Should they be removed? Well, yeah, we have um, several different invasive tree species in Central Park as well as different plants. Um, but it, invasive species all um, have the same sort of characteristics that define them. They're typically, most of the invasive tree species that we have are from, from uh, somewhere in Asia, typically China. Um, but you know, they're brought over here um, in some form or another, and they typically uh, don't have any natural predators and they outcompete native species or, or anything else that grows in the vicinity. Uh, and they're also prolific seed producers. So they just kind of pop up all over the place and are very successful at, at establishing, even in um, you know, poor or denuded soils. And so we do, we do try and, um, you know, manage those species as, as, as well as we can, although a lot of times it can be sort of a losing battle. So Peter, I want to throw out a question that has actually come from an audience member that relates to kind of this assessment. And we wonder if you have an answer. Mm -hmm. um, so Nancy has asked, can you use a stethoscope to listen to the interior of a tree? Like, could you hear it's, you know, the water or, or sap flowing from inside? Uh, I don't know if the human ear is, is that acute, but, um, you know, we use, we actually use a, a mallet. It's a, like a rubber mallet and uh, 
that's something we, we use on, on our, um, you know, routine inspections. Uh, and you can get pretty good at, at determining if there's like a, a cavity or like a, a dead patch in the tree. The, the sound will be a lot more dull if the wood is, is no longer functional, if, there's, if the vascular tissue no longer has, you know, water and nutrients flowing up and down it. Um, so that's, that's probably as close as it gets. And then Kimberly asked, uh, when Central Park was created, do you know if the, the designers put much attention or paid much attention to planting native trees specifically? Um, she's interested to know, you know, even today, do we, do we try to um, prioritize planting native trees? How has that maybe changed over time? Is there anything you can say about that? Yeah, we, we do try and prioritize planting native, native species. Um, you know, there's, there's only so much that's available in nurseries, but yeah, we, we try and, and plant uh, native species. I think, you know, when the park was first built, uh, it, was, it was built with the future in mind. And so they, they did try and plant a lot of native species throughout the park. Um, but, you know, we also have trees that establish on their own. We have a lot of native species that kind of establish on their own. And so in certain parts of the park, we'll Trying and trying to encourage those species to establish. If we get um, saplings popping up on their own, if it makes sense, you know, we might try and um, remove other things in the area to try and get that one little specimen to uh, take hold. Great. So, what would you say are some of the main threats to Central Park's trees, and and how do we manage these threats? Yeah, there there are a lot of um, you know. There are a lot of factors that our trees in the park have to contend with, um, you know, beyond just environmental issues and, um, you know, pest issues. The trees in the park, uh, there's, there's extremely heavy use in certain areas in most of the park. Um, so our, most of our soils are not only very shallow, but they're extremely compacted. And you can, this is a good example here. I think this is the sheep meadow. This is one of the the entrances and you know obviously this is, this is where people enter and exit the lawn all day long but I can tell you that this entire lawn is is compacted just from having people on it. and it, it's really quite amazing that these trees are able to survive in there at all um, but again they've kind of established over time to be able to acclimate to, to this environment um, but that's not to say that you know some of them end up declining and having issues that need to be addressed due to some of this, um, due to some of the use. Do you have um, a sense of what some of the hardiest trees are in the park? Yeah, some of the hardier trees in the park, uh, you know, I would, I would have to say uh, shagbark hickory, um, tulip trees, uh, you know, some of the, you know, red oaks are, are pretty hardy. Yeah. So what do you do when a tree has been damaged by wind or snow buildup? Yeah. So, you know, we typically have a few, you know, moderate to severe storms a year. It, it depends, but, um, you know, if we have excessive snow load, we'll certainly see some, some damage from that. Um, and when we have storms, you know, we kind of, go through a process of evaluating the park. You know, we look at the perimeter, see if there's anything out there, the, you know, transverse roads and the, then the drives. And we sort of work our way towards the center of the park, assessing the trees in that fashion, um, just very generally to get an idea of how much damage is out there. Uh, and then that typically involves, you know, depending on how severe the damage is, just, you know, removing stubs from broken branches or uh, evaluating, you know, whether an entire tree needs to, and evaluating whether a tree needs to be removed in its entirety due to, you know, the damage it's, it's uh, experienced. So what do we do with branches once they're removed from trees? So yeah, anytime we do any tree work in the park or have storms, uh, we, we chip up those branches on site. Um, typically anything that's uh, less than 18 inches in diameter, we can chip up with our chippers and the logs will then um, get put on a log truck and, and then we have a compound up in the uh, north end of the park uh, on the east side by um, 102 where we, we dump all of the wood chips and logs 
and then annually we'll have we'll bring in a tub grinder it's this giant machine and we'll put the uh the logs in there to get them ground up into chips and then those chips combined with all the other chips that we've accumulated throughout the year go back through the machine again it has different screens on it it can um, grind that material uh, into mulch uh, and we generate a giant pile of mulch and then we use that mulch in uh, different landscapes throughout the year that's a nice cycle to think of. Yeah. Yeah, it goes right back into the landscape. So what are some of the different techniques that your team employs for managing trees in woodlands as opposed to those in open areas? Yeah, so I spoke about this a little bit before, um, but in the woodlands, we will leave a lot of trees uh, that we, we couldn't leave in other, you know, um, landscaped areas of the park that have a lot higher use. Um, there are a lot of areas in the woodlands that are closed off to people or are supposed to be closed off to people. Um, uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll leave trees that um, have storm damage that have naturally kind of broken tops or, or broken branches because that is very attractive to certain uh, bird species and, and insects. And we, again, we want to kind of promote as much uh, wildlife use as possible. Central Park is a very important migratory bird stop. So we get a lot of different bird species uh, visiting the park throughout the year. And, you know, you see a lot of people out there uh, enjoying the birds in the park and, and uh, taking pictures, especially in the, you know, the Ramble, the North Woods and the, and the Hallett. So, um, yeah, we try and we, we also try and leave, uh, you know, thoughtfully, we, we leave debris on the ground. Um, because that also provides a lot of habitat. And you already talked to us a little bit about snags or standing dead trees. Um, and, and you mentioned that we keep these because they can make nests or nesting places for some of these migratory birds, or is, is there anything else you can tell us about those? Yeah, well, they're typically, they're typically not dead necessarily. Um, but, you know, we'll maintain these trees as, as living specimens that have sort of been you know, knocked down to a height of 20 or 30 feet or so. Uh, so they're still, they're still, you know, producing leaves annually, but they have, you know, big areas of decay, um, which, which provide, yeah, perfect habitat for a bird to go in and, and make a nest or uh, bats um, uh, or other, you know, wildlife. Are there any wildlife or um, like species of birds that we find are, damaging to the trees? Somebody was, was wondering about, um, you know, when the cicadas come in. Um, cicadas, that, yeah. Cicadas, sorry. Um, okay. Does that cause any harm to the trees? We, we, yeah, we have some bird species that are uh, somewhat of a nuisance. Um, we have a lot of sap suckers that, um, you know, will go after different tree species and they, they, they're either going after, you know, insects underneath the bark, um, and they kind of, it looks like, you know, you'll see, it looks like somebody shot this tree with a little machine gun or something. You just see these little holes all over the place. Um, and they tend to do that to a lot of, um, a lot of different species, but a lot of ornamentals um, and thin bark trees like birches. Um, and we have some measures to kind of combat that, but for the most part, we just sort of monitor. It doesn't tend to be a, a very widespread issue. So do you have a favorite tree? I certainly do. Um, and it, it varies a lot. You know, I see a lot of trees, so my, my preference towards them sort of kind of leans in different directions depending on the, the time of year. But um, these are two examples of, of really beautiful trees. Uh, on the left, this is a, a black tupelo. Um, and there are some really amazing black tupelos throughout the park. Uh, this one in particular is in the middle of the ramble. Uh, if you go, there's a main east-west path in the Ramble, and this is right in the middle of it in a, a big lawn area, at the edge of a big lawn area. And this tree is unmistakable. It's fenced off. Uh, and tupelos are, are really cool. They have a very interesting, um, they have a very fine branch, te branch texture. And the fine branches sort of create this like layered effect. Um, so they're really beautiful in the dormant season when there's no leaves. Um, but they're great in the growing season. They grow next to water bodies a lot of time. They really like uh, 
wet areas. So you'll see them at the edge of a shoreline, like growing right over a water body. There's some around the lake that are really cool. They just kind of grow out and have this um, really interesting texture. Uh, and they have a beautiful fall foliage. It's extremely bright red, really vibrant. And, um, you know, throughout the season, you kind of get these cool uh, color gradients as it, as it changes to that red. And on the left, uh, sorry, on the right-hand side, uh, this is an example of a sweet gum. Um, sweet gums are um, another species that we have a lot of throughout the park and in the woodlands. And uh, they also have a really, really amazing fall color. Um, their fall color tends to be a little bit lighter red, but same kind of change in color gradient. You know, they go from like this yellow into this bright pink uh, and then into a red. They almost look like sort of like a bright bubblegum color a lot of times. Um, and they can be really striking. So um, look out for the sweet gums and the tupelos. I know I'll make a point to go visit them this fall. So one of the questions we've had from the audience is, what do you reckon is the biggest challenge that you all have in caring for all the trees in the park? Yeah, I, you know, one of the biggest challenges we have is, you know, we have a lot of disease issues that we contend with on an annual basis. Um, Dutch elm disease is a good example. That's, that's something that we're, we're dealing with, um, you know, will be coming up soon. Um, you know, the adults will, adult beetles hatch, basically, they, they live in, in dead elm wood, which um, has this fungus, which is the Dutch elm disease fungus. Um, and, and it lives also lives in this dead elm wood. And so the beetles emerge in the springtime. They have this fungus, the spores of this fungus on their back. They seek out healthy elm trees. They burrow into the tops, generally into the one to two inch branches in the tops of these of, of healthy elm trees. Um, and then the spores are released into the vascular system, which then starts to kill that portion of the branch. And, and this is obvious because the branch starts to turn yellow. We go out and we monitor for this very intensely in the springtime. Um, but that's, you know, the disease issues uh, are something that are, are really significant. Um, you know, emerald ash borer is something that's moving in. So uh, that specifically affects ash trees. That's something that we're um, kind of trying to contend with right now. There are some preventative measures for those, those two diseases that I just mentioned. Um, but, you know, besides just uh, pest issues that we have, you know, there's a lot of issues with just the general use of the park, um, you know, like I said, we have a lot of uh, a lot of issues with compaction um, and just poor soil quality. So you know, we go around and try and make sure that our our trees, um, you know, don't have uh, a lot of soil getting mounted up around the bases. We try and make sure that they have you know nice exposed root flares and and that um, you know uh, we can try and mitigate that as much as as we, as we can. So one of our um, viewers asked if vandalism is an issue at all for tree care and conservation. Yeah, it is. Again, you know, it's the same kind of use issue. People see trees and they, um, you know, they uh, sort of take them for granted, I guess. Uh, but there's a lot of thin barked tree species that people are accustomed to, you know, carving into like uh, the beech trees throughout the park. They have a very thin, um, very thin, consistent bark. It almost looks like elephant skin. Um, and yeah, people will call, carve their names in. And, you know, generally it, it, it's, it's more of a, an aesthetic nuisance than anything else. It takes a, a lot of that kind of damage to really have a, an impact on, on a tree's health. Um, but it's certainly not something we like to see. Right. Would you say, this is actually a question for me, do you have a sense of what some of the oldest trees in the park are? Do we have an oldest tree in the park? Well, it's hard to say that definitively, uh, unless you know we, we can track down exactly when a tree was planted, but um, our oldest trees in the park, so this is a good example. During Hurricane Sandy, uh, we had a tree in the North Woods that came down, it uprooted completely. So this was over by Huddlestone Arch. So um, on the east side of the North Woods, right across the street from Lasker Pool, you can walk underneath Huddlestone right into the North Woods there. And that's where the, uh, the lock um, comes down. And there was a, a large pin oak growing right out of, out of the side of the stream, um, kind of 
attached to a, a couple of big rocks. So it didn't, it didn't have much roots. You know, it just had a few straggly roots that were like shooting back into the stream bed. So this tree came down completely across the stream. It was a real production to get it out of there. Um, but it was completely solid all the way through. And we counted the rings um, at a cross section pretty close to the ground. And that tree was about 180 years old, 170, 180 years old. We counted it a few times and, you know, got a few different numbers each time. But, um, you know, that goes back right around to the, the same time that the park was built. So, I, you know, if I had to say, I, I would say our oldest trees are around that. Wow. Yeah. We have, um, we have a few more questions. I hope you don't mind if I share them with you. Sure. Um, so here's an interesting one. Are there water, lawn, or other park management practices that impact either positively or negatively the work that the arborists do? Can you repeat the first part? So she's, Kim, Kimberly said, are there water, lawn, or other park management practices that you know, contribute or impact your work, either positively or negatively? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the other work that goes on in the park, like irrigating the lawns, um, you know, that certainly benefits trees at, at certain times of the year when, when there might be uh, less rainfall, you know, when we're in a bit of a, a drought period, um, you know, the, the trees are benefiting from that just as much, you know, that irrigation just as much as the, as the lawns are. Uh, even though it's not necessarily intended for the trees. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's probably the biggest kind of dual benefit, I guess. Uh, we do have a lot of irrigation in the, the big lawn areas of the park. Um, so when the sprinklers go on, you know, the trees are getting that, that same water. Uh, we also have a team of staff that take care of the, the wooded areas of the park, um, our natural area staff. And so, you know, the work that they do is kind of, goes in tandem with the work that we do in those natural areas on the trees, um, you know, kind of towards the same goals. Wonderful. Peter, this has been so revelatory to us. I guess in kind of departing the program, I wanted to ask, what can we, the public, do to help keep the trees healthy and to support the work that you and the Conservancy are undertaking? Uh, that's a great question. I, I would say that, um, you know, the, the biggest thing that people can do is, you know, just observe trees from a distance, you know, try and avoid walking around their immediate or what we would refer to as their critical root zone, you know, that 15 to 20 foot area off radiating, radiating out from the trunk of the tree. Um, and then, you know, of course, if there's, if, if there's a closed off area or if there's fence up for, uh, you know, around trees, that fence is there for a reason, you know, just, just stay out of the area. And, you know, if you see other people, um, you know, sort of doing those things, you know, maybe just try and pass it along. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so on that note, I just want to thank uh, Peter for, for so generously offering your time and your expertise to us today to speak about this really fascinating and interesting topic. Um, and thank you to our audience for your um, thoughtful questions. I've, I've certainly walked away knowing a lot more about Central Park's trees than I did at the beginning. So again, thank you. I really, we really appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, so I just wanted to stop by uh, reminding you all that this program um, is a part of the work that is, is, sorry, this program is here to display the work that Central Park Conservancy does. Um, we are a public-private partnership um, with New York City, which means that we can't do our work without you. Just by joining this program, you've helped us to spread the word about all the work that we do. And again, we want to thank you for that. If you've enjoyed today, then we hope that you'll join us for um, the next part in this six-piece series. Um, we're going to be joined by our historian, Marie Warsh, who's going to speak about um, how Central Park has welcomed visitors throughout history. And that program will be on June 16th. So I would like to just thank you all again on behalf of the Conservancy for coming. And we hope that you will stay safe and be well. And thank you again, Peter. Thanks.